Well, let's begin then with uh, human capital and social capital. Stated differently, human tools and social tools that make us more productive, able to accomplish our economic goals more efficiently with less labor and less consumption of raw materials. So when we talk about human capital, we could be talking about human skills. Now it could be maybe typing skills, your ability to type is a form of human capital, your ability to create an income statement or a balance sheet or um, taking care of a set of books for a company, that would be human capital. Your ability to add, subtract, and multiply in your head, or to use a calculator, or a spreadsheet, or a word processor. Those are all forms of human capital. Your ability to use mathematics to build mathematical models, maybe architectural models, or inventory models. All forms of human capital. Um, a basketball player's or a golf pros um, development of physical skills is the capital he needs in order to make a living be the, put those little balls and those little round holes a long long way away and people clap and will pay money to see people do that those are human skills and human tools which we would call different skills again all the way from intellectual to physical skills, learning to run a backhoe, for instance, or learning to run a piece of heavy equipment would be a kind of human capital. There's another kind of capital, though, and that's called social capital or social tools. And when we're thinking about social capital, I, I, what comes to my mind would be ethical norms that allow a society to be more productive, not just mental tools or physical skills, but social norms. Um, I, let me give you a very quick illustration. Um, if all of a sudden people decided to just flat ignore stoplights, I just don't do stoplights anymore. I used to do stoplights, but I don't do stoplights anymore. And everybody has the same attitude, they don't do stoplights. It, if you go south of the border to Mexico, you might have a feel for what I'm talking about. I mean, they, they, they stop if somebody's coming very fast. Other than that, why stop? You don't stop. Why stop? It's a waste of time. You know? But Americans have a social capital norm that other people from other countries think is a little bit odd sometimes, that we could be out in the middle of nowhere complete visibility if there's a stop sign there and we pull up and we stop not because anybody's coming we can see nobody's coming but we stop because that is the way that we've been socially conditioned or trained to operate in society now if everybody just said no 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 stop signs are only recommendations they're warnings that somebody could be coming the other way so if you look and nobody's coming or not coming very fast well then you just scoot on through now if we did that probably you would expect the accident rate would go up you know, things would get broken a whole lot more often and our national productivity would go down so the fact that people honor that convention, and it's simply a convention, just like right, driving on the right side of the road is a convention, it's not any morally or ethically correct to be drive, go forward on the right side than to do something stupid like the British, which drive on the wrong side of the road, right? That's just a convention. As long as everybody goes along with the same convention, we're a whole lot more productive. So I'm giving you illustrations of social capital when people as a whole, as a society, um, 
govern our behavior in a way that increases productivity and increases economic output. Let me give you an illustration from a friend of mine who passed away, um, I guess, quite a few years now. It doesn't seem that long. But he was an immigrant um, from Armenia. And when he came to New York City, he was about four or five years old, didn't know the language or anything. But he was an immigrant, very poor immigrant. And he walked to school, and part of his walk um, was, was through Wall Street. And a lot of banks were going on during that time period. And we're talking about a period in where there was probably more horse and buggy and carriage and wagon traffic than there was automobile or something like that. So it's very early, and the banks would have to settle their accounts. They would write checks back and forth. And so if a lot of checks were written on this bank, but they were deposited in this bank, well, then pretty soon you got to sell the account that this bank says, hey, these guys wrote a check, so here's the check that's drawn on your bank. We need the gold coins now to put in this guy's account over here because a check went from drawing out of that account to that account, and so we got to get it over there. And so they had to clear their accounts, and so they'd all meet together, and they would say, okay, there's so many going to you, and so many going to you, and get the balance, and so they balance it all out, and they would clear the checks that way. But something at the day, or how often they did this, you actually had to move the gold coins from one bank to the other periodically so that things would balance. And they would have them in big canvas bags, gold coins, $20 gold pieces. And, of course, they were in the back of a buckboard, horse-drawn bring type of thing, and you would have to drag them all there, and you'd have to carry them into the bank, <laughs> right, when we're talking about that kind of money. Well, you keep doing that, keep doing it. If you're not careful, since those gold coins are very heavy, uh, the, the bottom of the bags get frayed and worn a little bit, and freeze-thaw pretty soon the nails tend to work their way up through the boards every once in a while. If you've noticed that with lumber outside, when the freeze and thaws, the nails kind of work their way out. You've got to keep pounding them down. Well, if one of those nails kind of came up a little bit and the bag was worn, you grab it and didn't go. And so the guard would just give it a good yank, and all of a sudden the bag would rip, and there would be gold coins, $20 gold pieces, all the way over the sidewalk. Can anybody guess what happened then? Can anybody just kind of in your wildest imagine what happened in the middle of Wall Street when all these gold coins just started scattered all over the sidewalk? Any guesses? Everybody started like a mad rush to pick them up. Could you imagine what it was like? Could you imagine how chaotic it would be? I don't think you can imagine. Because what he told me was, and if I got it straight from him, so he was there, he was the eyewitness, he was a little boy, six, seven years old, something like that, eight. He said that the businessmen would be walking with their little briefcases down, and the gold coins would go all over the sidewalk. He said instantly, everybody in that area would stop. They would completely come to a complete standstill. They would look down, and if there was a gold coin at their feet, they'd take one step back. If there was another gold coin at their feet, they'd take another step back. And they kept taking a step back until there was a complete circle around all the gold coins laying on the, on the, on the sidewalk. And then they said, he, he's I'm telling you the truth. He's told me this. This is first-hand testimony from, from him. He would, they would set down their briefcase. They'd grab the hand over this guy, and they'd grab the hand of this guy. They would stand there. They would stand there until the guard went into the bank, got a new bag, came back out, picked it all up, and walked it into the bank. And then they'd drop hands, and they'd pick the thing and walk on down the street. <laughs> Something else he told me was that if, if you happen to be one of those people, and all of a sudden your knee or ankle started to itch, and you started to itch your ankle or lean over. He said, anybody standing behind you would give you a swift kick. Now is not the time to itch your ankle. <laughs> now I know that's in a universe long, long time ago in a universe far, far away, 
but that was his illustration of what happened in that kind of event in the middle of New York City when some of those bags would break. Now that's my illustration of social capital. Did the cost of banking go down because of social capital? Did they have to have a lot more police with that kind of social capital? Did they have to have a lot more insurance, a lot more security if there were people of that character? No, their costs went down. Their cost of loss went down. There was less, uh, you can imagine. It was a whole lot less risk to do business in a culture had such regard for private property that they felt it was their duty to their neighbor, that they were their neighbor's keeper, even if their neighbor was a bank, and they didn't like a bank, but it was still their duty to protect the property of their neighbor. So this is a story that I got firsthand from a person who was there, witnessed that, and told that particular story, or I wouldn't have believed it myself, and I wouldn't share it with you. Those are two illustrations of human and social capital. We'll begin the next session with um, Malthus and Malthusianism.